Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the online services for the Cordova Church of Christ. My name is Kyle, and I'm the preaching minister here, and I want you to know I am preaching in pants and flip-flops today. If this is your first time with us, I want to walk you through the flow of our time together. We're going to begin with a prayer from one of our shepherds, and then I have an encouraging word for you, and then we will end our time with communion, followed by a blessing. And with that, I want to turn it over to Bill Mara, who is bringing us our shepherd's prayer today. Currently, we are living in unprecedented times. We can choose to complain. We can choose to isolate. We can choose to hide out. We can choose to ignore the government and impose rules altogether. Or we can choose to be the disciples of Christ and children of God we are called to be. We have an opportunity to show the love of Christ to those around us. Or to allow those around us to show the love of Christ to others by allowing them to serve us. Recently, Janice and I found ourselves in a very scary situation. We, I went in for an outpatient procedure, and a week later, I'm still in the hospital, preparing for a completely different surgery. Unfortunately, this background is not a cool virtual background. No, it is my reality background. Many from my faith community have stepped up to serve us and to show us that we are loved. Also, many from the medical community have also stepped up and showed us that we are loved. We are thankful for both of these communities. But as Christians, shouldn't we be the shining light in the current darkness? Shouldn't there be such an outpouring of love from Christians that it can't go unnoticed by those who receive it and by those who see it happening around them? Let us pray. Glorious and powerful Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus, who came from heaven to earth to save each of us. Help us, Father, to be your servants during these strange times. Help us to be your bright and shining light on the hilltop. Help us to show more love to more people and to touch more lives, even during these times of isolation. Father, I personally thank you for the love that has been shown to Janus and I this last week. Thank you for your answered prayers we have already received. We are looking forward to continuing to see your hand in my healing process as we go forward, Father. Thank you, Father, for watching over us. Father, there are many on our prayer list this week that need your love as well. Many that need your answered prayers. We ask that you touch them and send them your love, however you choose to do that, Father. Father, be with your church all around the world. Be with Cordova. Let us be your loving arms, your loving hands, your loving feet, your loving mouths, and your loving hearts. Showing more love to each other and more love to those that don't know your son Jesus during any other time in history. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay. Let's talk about Jesus. This morning, we are going to be in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. We're ending a series that I've called Open Tomb, Open Eyes, where we explore different stories in the resurrection that, that happened after Jesus rises from the dead and, and, and his interactions with different people. And, and the premise of this series is that as our eyes are open to Jesus, he opens our lives to others. That, that as we become more aware of the resurrection and new creation, it changes us and, and the values and the practices, and we begin to live for others, not ourselves. And one thing I've really enjoyed about this series is how it reminds me that Easter is not a moment, it's a season, right? 
The resurrection just happened, and then you, you move on. Like Jesus rises, and then different people come to this awareness in, in their time um, by the power of God. And that has just been really important to me uh, as we live in quarantine land to, to remind myself that, that God is still working, that God is still moving. He doesn't work in just moments. He works in seasons as well. So with that, let's turn to our story. This again is Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor of Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? All right, so our story takes place a few hours after the women have gone to the tomb, seen the empty tomb, seen the angels, met the risen Jesus, run back, told everybody what happened. They, they, these two characters, one of them who is named Cleopas, uh, they are now traveling away from Jerusalem to the city of Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And, and remember, when you wanna bring out the power of a text, one of the ways that we do that is by paying attention to the movement in the story. Our characters are going away from Jerusalem. Now, in Luke's gospel, Jerusalem is an important location. The, the story from beginning, to, from beginning to end, or at least from, from the beginning so far, uh, it, it's, it's intended to move towards Jerusalem. That, that Jerusalem is the place where everything happens. Jesus doesn't just go to Jerusalem and then come back and then go to Jerusalem and come back. Like, like he, he slowly, intentionally moves towards Jerusalem because Jerusalem is where he's going to die. Jerusalem is where he's going to rise. Jerusalem is where faith is going to be born. Our characters are walking away from that location because our characters don't believe the women. Our characters... Cleopas and friends, they, he, they don't understand what's happening. And, and in, in Luke, and in, in really all of the Gospels to some degree, this is a very common occurrence, the disciples not understanding. Jesus will do a thing, the disciples won't understand. Jesus will do another thing, the disciples will still not understand. That happens over and over and over again. And the reason that I want to point it out to you this morning is that some of us, we may not understand Jesus. We may be new to this whole faith thing and, and we're trying to figure it out and, and we don't understand. And that might be frustrating, but, but I want you to know if you don't understand Jesus, you're actually in really good company. Uh, that, that understanding Jesus, that's a lifetime. That doesn't always just happen overnight for everyone. Bible characters who literally saw Jesus do the things still didn't understand. It's okay. Keep searching, keep going, don't stop. You know, recently, I was reminded of the importance of remembering uh, that it's okay to not understand. I was having a conversation with a friend who is uh, exploring faith and, 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 and very new to all of this. And we were having a conversation and one of the things he said to me was, I may not talk much because I don't want to be wrong. And I chuckled and, and I said, dude, you don't ever have to worry about being wrong with me. You don't ever have to be ashamed of being wrong with me. You don't ever have to be ashamed of being wrong with Jesus, right? I mean, I'm wrong all the time. Not in my sermons, but like other times I'm wrong. You know, for, for me, I think being wrong can be the beginning of being right. That, that those, those moments where, where I'm confused, those moments where I give an answer that's not correct, those moments where I make a decision that turns out to be a bad one, those are actually beautiful opportunities for growth if I'll just keep going, if I won't stop. You see, the thing about Jesus is that, that Jesus is both simple and he's complex. 
that, that Jesus is both obvious in some ways and also subtle. Like Jesus is like a fine wine that, that after multiple tastings, you discover new flavors each time. Uh, he's, he's that album that you listen to over and over and over again, and each time you hear new chords, new melodies, new words that, that have new meaning for you. We are all going to get stuff wrong on the journey with Jesus. And Jesus is still going to be on this journey with us. And I also want to, want to point out, if you're someone who is a believer, and you have that friend who is struggling to believe, and, and it frustrates you, or you're worried about them, I want to encourage you this morning, take a breath. You don't have to worry about them, or really about anything. But remember that the earliest disciples did not come around to Jesus overnight. It wasn't easy for all of them to get what was going on. And I know it can be very hard because you love your friends, particularly if you're a parent and you're worried about your kids, particularly if they're teenagers. You're like, oh, they don't have faith yet. What do we do? Like, take a breath and keep praying. God's got this. Trust Him. I'm not saying you can't talk to them. I'm not, I'm not saying you can't engage them in faith. No, no, none of that. You keep talking to them. But don't do it out of fear. Don't try to force the conversation. Trust the Spirit. God's got you. God's got them. Okay, so, so let's go back to the story. So you got these disciples who don't seem to understand what's happened, and here comes Jesus, but they don't recognize him. And, and the reasons for that are varied, and, and I think we're going to talk about that in our, our podcast this week. And if you want to listen to that, we'll make sure to put a link to our podcast in the video description. So there's Jesus, and it's a secret that he's Jesus, so we'll call him Secret Jesus now. And so, so Secret Jesus asks them what they're talking about. He comes alongside them as they're walking, and he says, Hey, what are you, what are you discussing here? And that question, it hits them like a ton of bricks. The walking stops. Notice their movement. They stand still and are sad. It's as if when, when secret Jesus asks them about what happened, the weight of what happened falls on their shoulders and it brings their journey to a halt. Jesus, their Lord, their friend, the one who was supposed to be their savior. He died. Everything that they had given their life for, for however long they'd been following him, it was a waste. That journey is over, and now they have to go home, and they have to start over. And starting over can sometimes be crushing. And starting over can sometimes be embarrassing. Maybe there are friends who watch them and say, he's not Messiah, and now they're going to have to hear the I told you so's. And so they're sorrowful. And here's Jesus, once again, meeting his people in their sorrow. They can't see that it's Jesus, but Jesus is right there with them, and he is about to change the world because that's what Jesus does. He comes to us in our sorrows, he walks with us in our pains, and he changes our worlds. And I know you're probably thinking, Kyle, you've literally said this every week of this series. We get it. We know this. Sure. I mean, I get it, and I know this, here, but sometimes I struggle to get it here, particularly in seasons of stress. This week I was reading about how you can describe this world in pandemic land as VUCA. VUCA is an acronym that stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So that's a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. It's volatile because there's tension 
and, and frustrations are building and are on the rise. And some of us, uh, we might be set off to explode, or maybe some of us have exploded in, in, against small things that didn't really justify it. But it's because we've got tensions and, and stress that's just kind of all building up in our mind spaces. It's uncertain because we don't know when quarantine is going to end, when we're going to return to normal, or, or even what that normal's going to look like. I just read this morning that Disneyland may not open until 2021. That means I have to spend, live in a world for the next however many months are in this current, left in this year, because time has no meaning, in, a, in, a, in that world where Disneyland is closed. And they may not open again. It's complex because there aren't simple answers out there. Like we want there to be, right? We, we want there to be, let's just flip a switch and blow a whistle and open everything back up and go back to normal. But that's just not how it works. And some of us disagree even on that. And that only increases the, the volatility of the whole thing. It's ambiguous. It's ambiguous because all of these changes lead to new ways of living. They lead to schedules that seem to change week in and week out, <laughs> day in and day out. And, and the, the, like that job security that we had in the beginning, that's becoming increasingly less secure because we're not sure what's going to happen. There's a lot of ambiguity in that world, in this world. And so in these VUCA times, sometimes our core beliefs, they become challenged. Uh, we begin to question them. Uh, we even might forget them. As our brains are, are, are swimming in chemicals that, that come from those negative experiences, it becomes harder and harder and harder and harder to pursue joy and peace and rest. We have to fight for joy and peace and rest. It becomes harder to remember beauty. And so each week I remind you of these simple, beautiful truths in case you'd forgotten. Because we all forget sometimes. And the simple, beautiful truth is that Jesus is here with us. That Jesus meets with us. He walks with us. He's not going anywhere. Jesus is not canceled. He can't be canceled. That Jesus is carrying us and he's bringing with him the power of the resurrection. That, that spirit lives within us and it's going to stay there with us Christians. That we are going to be okay. That our children are going to be okay. We are going to get through this together for however long this lasts. Okay, so let's get back into our story. So Cleopas, he cannot believe that secret Jesus doesn't know what's going on. How do you not know what's happening, he says. And, and Luke is being a little bit ironic when he's telling us this, right? Like, like Cleopas is voicing what Cleopas actually needs to hear. Cleopas doesn't know what's happening here. Secret Jesus, he actually does know what's going on, and he's going to tell them in a moment. So Cleopas responds to this person who doesn't know what's happening. And, and like, the, the text doesn't say this, but as I read this and as I'm thinking about like what feelings I might be feeling in this story, I'd probably be annoyed uh, that this guy is asking me to rehash some things that are really painful. And so maybe he's a little half-hearted, or maybe he rushes through what happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus of Nazareth, who was this prophet, mighty in power of God and word and deed, etc., etc., he was crucified and buried. And he was supposed to be the Savior, but I guess that's not going to happen. And then three days later, some women go to their tomb, and they see the tomb's empty, and they meet some angels, and they see Jesus. So then our friends run over there today to see this empty tomb and to see Jesus, but there's a tomb that's empty, but there's no Jesus, so what are you going to do? I imagine Jesus kind of chuckles and then says, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, 
here's why I think Jesus chuckles a little bit. That term, O foolish ones, is not meant to be a put down. It's not meant to be an insult. He's drawing attention to their lack of understanding. He's doing that because you cannot change what has not yet been named. And he couples that with that phrase, slow of heart, which, which is also intended to draw attention to their attitude, or rather their lack of a proper attitude. They are sad at the results of the story because they have missed what the prophets and all of Scripture had been pointing to them the whole time. They have failed to properly orient their lives and their attitude to the way of God because they have failed to grasp who Jesus really was. They are heading away from Jerusalem and Jesus needs them to go back to Jerusalem. And so he will name the problem so that it can be changed. Jesus is going to draw attention to their misunderstanding, and then he's going to sit with them and direct their attention to the truth of what went down over the last three days and what Scripture has been pointing them to all along. And in our podcast this week, we're going to look at what those Scriptures might have been. Luke does not tell us. He doesn't give us specifics, at least within this part of the story. But he does give us the main point. And Jesus' main point is that Messiah's suffering was always intended to be a part of the story. That he is the suffering servant of Isaiah who brings rescue and redemption. By his wounds we are healed. That, 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 that's, that's the Jesus story in a nutshell. Suffering leads to salvation. Death leads to life. And they had missed that even though they knew the scriptures. Which reminds me, sometimes you can know the Bible without actually knowing the Bible. Sometimes you can quote it, you can memorize it, and still completely miss the point. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't quote the Bible, I'm not saying you shouldn't memorize the Bibles. I think these are great practices, but that's what they are. They're practices, they're vehicles that equip us for living out this story. But if you don't understand this story, then you're not going to understand these things that you're quoting. And so you have to have the right lens. And the lens that helps us read Scripture accurately, the lens by which we form our theologies and our practices, they are the cross and the resurrection. How we read the scriptures begins and ends with Jesus. For example, we see this in the New Testament really well. Uh, in, in Philippians, we're doing a Bible study on Sunday nights through the book of Philippians, and I am loving it. And, and, and there's this moment uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, and really kind of happens in the end of chapter 1, and Paul is trying to get them to be of one mind, one accord. And he says, in order to do this, you, you can't do anything out of selfish ambition. You have to put others first. And the reason that we put others first is because that's what Jesus does. And so he, he tells them in, in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, this, this beautiful song that summarizes the gospel about how Jesus was God, but became a servant and took, 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 took that to the extreme where he even died. And, and how in his death, God raised him up to life and exalted him that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. That, 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 that story that he's telling them is that death leads to life, that suffering leads to salvation. I know quarantine land is filled with frustration upon frustration upon frustration, and I know we are all making sacrifices. And, and you know, at the beginning, when this first started, it was really easy to make those sacrifices. It was really easy to say like, yeah, we're all in this together. Huzzah, we wanna protect the vulnerable and the elderly. And it's not that bad. It's like a nice vacation. And we'll be back at the end of March. It's a little harder to be all huzzah now, right? Not that we have stopped loving the vulnerable or the elderly. It's just we had an expectation. We had an unspoken expectation that wasn't met. And that kind of weighs on us. And I'm reminded how Christians willingly make sacrifices because we follow the sacrificial Lord. This is how we show love. 
And, and, and this is how we reframe that, that struggle of quarantine land. And, and I was doing that this week, and, and I actually feel like I did, a, did an okay job at it. There, there were a couple of moments this week during crisis schooling where it wasn't anybody's fault, really, but my frustration was starting to rise and build, but I didn't lose my cool. I didn't just push Isaac away and throw my hands in the air. I, I didn't make him cry. And, and the, the, the way that I did that was, in, that, in those moments, I asked myself to see this story through the eyes of Jesus. That Jesus w- would sit and would lovingly help my son learn about penguins and work on his brainstorm tree, even after the umpteenth question or, or the eye roll, that Jesus would be patient, that Jesus would lovingly help my son learn. And the reason Jesus would do that is because Jesus loves my son Isaac, and I love my son Isaac, and I want to love him well. And the best love is the love of Jesus. And so if I want to love Isaac, I want to love him like Jesus. And I'm not saying that I'm a perfect parent. I'm sure there are lots of other things that I did very bad this week, but I didn't make him cry. And and I feel like that might be a first. (laughs) And I didn't yell at him. Because I'm trying to reframe quarantine time in light of who Jesus is. And, and that's one way that I've done. There are a couple other things that I'm working on. And, and I encourage you to do that this week. Yeah, it's, it's getting hard. It's getting frust- it's Well, it's not getting hard. It's hard. It's frustrating. I'm tired of this. Still am. But there's good. There's good coming from this. And so if you need to this week, take some time and reframe your circumstances. Pray and and try to see your world through the eyes of Jesus. Try to make, to think about the people that you are making these sacrifices for. Because we do it for love. And you know, when I focus on the people I love, the stress just kind of melts away. Over time, it doesn't just instantly vanish, but, but it becomes, becomes manageable, it becomes doable. When I focus on the people I love, I'm able to breathe again in a world that is becoming increasingly suffocating. Okay, let's take one, trip back, uh, one last trip back into our story. You see, Jesus teaches them all of these things, but at the end of his teaching, To them, he's still secret Jesus. They haven't recognized that they're with Jesus yet. And that moment actually comes later when they get to Emmaus. And the story continues. It says, So he, Jesus, went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen. Indeed, he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Food. Hospitality. They play an important role in Luke's gospel. Luke Luke uses a number of feast stories, and those feasts are often images of the kingdom of God where God's will is on full display and experience because there is something holy that happens when we sit together and eat and share a meal together, when we share life together as love is born. And in this story, it's no different. It is not until the bread is broken that their eyes are open. It is not until they practice hospitality that their eyes are open to Jesus' identity. They invite him to stay with him, them. This stranger that they do not know. They invite him to the table, sharing their food with him. This stranger that they do not know. They are giving of themselves. They are making a sacrifice for a stranger, and as they give, 
so too do they receive and find life. What's interesting, yeah, there's another kind of Lucan irony here is that Jesus is invited as a guest, but then he becomes the, the one who is, who is, who is the, the hospitable one. He's the one inviting them because he takes the bread and breaks it and blesses it and gives it to them. And that's when they see him. And having discovered that Jesus was before them alive and risen, the story makes this final movement back into Jerusalem, back to the disciples who uh, they themselves have seen the resurrection, and they join in this proclamation that he is risen. And I love this part of the story. Notice they don't wait. With their newly opened eyes, they return that hour with newly opened lives to the disciples. They go back to Jerusalem. They go back to the mission of God, because that's what you do when your eyes are open to Jesus. You embrace the mission of God to tell others about him, to share your life with others, to be hospitable as the Lord has been hospitable to you. And there's a lot more we could talk about here, but for now, I just want to end by thinking about the table that Jesus invites us to. And I'm not talking about the Lord's Supper. I'm talking about the table of fellowship. I'm talking about Jesus himself. Jesus is the table as much as he is also the bread of life, the unending spring. I want you to think about Jesus' hospitality. Are you sharing in the Lord's hospitality today? I was reading this week, um, you know, along with the VUCA world, I was reading also about the importance of pathways in a VUCA world. It's important to have markers that help people uh, stay regulated, um, that provide a little bit of stability in uncertain times. And so as we think about the hospitality of the Lord, I, I invite you to consider a few markers that help you uh, stay focused on Jesus' hospitality. Um, and naturally, we'll probably dive into these more on the podcast. The first marker that I want you to consider is the marker of faith. Your trust and allegiance. It's that heart and mind belief that comes when, when you acknowledge, when I acknowledge and accept Jesus as King, Savior, and Friend. How's your faith? How's it doing? With faith comes this reordering of priorities, a reshuffling of self. We begin to rethink our values, our patterns of behavior as we dive deeper into Jesus and his way of being, as we let his spirit mold us in his image. How's your reordering? Who sets the tone for your priorities this week? In that reordering, there comes confession. This confession is a public proclamation that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus is your friend. And it's a public proclamation because Christianity is not an individualistic journey into the interior life. It is a, it is a public communal experience. How's your confession? How's your public proclamation of Jesus' Lordship? And somewhere in that reordering comes baptism. Baptism, where we enter into the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, where we embrace the forgiveness that has been extended to us on the cross. Remember your baptism. If you have been baptized, and if you haven't been baptized, why not? What's holding you back? I, I get it. There, there are reasons, but let's talk about those reasons. And I would love to talk with you about it. So if you want to send me a text or an email and talk more about that, please, please feel free to. And I want to say this as we end. This reordering, it's a lifetime journey. It's a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new way of developing and being, and that takes time. And these markers are important, our faith, 
our reordering, our confession, our baptism. These markers are important because they keep us going on the journey. They, as we look at them, as we think about them, they dive us deeper and deeper into the significance and, and the purpose of Jesus. And let's remember that just like the earliest disciples, Mary Magdalene, Peter, Cleopas and friend, and all of the rest, when you see the resurrection, you share the resurrection. We share the story with whomever, whenever, and however we can in the hopes that others will join with us. Because when your eyes are open to who Jesus is, he opens your life to others. Be safe, be healthy, be a blessing. At this time, we're going to transition into our communion, the Lord's table. It's a practice we do every week to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and to celebrate the unity that comes through the Spirit of God. Good morning, Cordova. Um, I know this is all kind of uh, different. Um, we've had a couple Sundays now where we've been able to do communion uh, over the internet. Um, and so however you are joining us this morning, I welcome you to the table. Um, I'd like to take a second to look at John chapter 1, verse 6. Um, and then we'll read through there. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Verse 14. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithless. And we have seen his glory and the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me. He was far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithless, faithlessness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. I know in this uh, difficult time with uh, so many unknowns and and really not understanding what's going on. This is a, a hard time to uh, kind of set our minds at ease. But of all people in the world, as Christians, we know that the, the true sense of faith is we're okay. We're saved. That this time together is one that uh, we, we can take this opportunity to stretch and to grow, to support one another, to be able to lift each other up in prayer. Um, to take the time to study and and really to reach out to one another. This is one of the hardest times um, and hardest things, uh, depending on people's situation. And so we just ask that you would take this time now to spend some time together uh, with your family or with your you know, the group that you're staying with uh, to say, um, you know, to take this opportunity to to really understand and take this chance to to be with one another. Um, we'll say a prayer here um, for the bread, um, and then once uh, 
give people time to to do that and then we will say a prayer for uh, the juice and whatever that is that you have at the time uh, if you pray with me lord thank you so much for all you do for us thank you so much for uh, this time that we have um, even if it's in a remote setting to be able to uh, to pray together and to know that your son sacrificed that his body that was broken for us is what saves us and gives us the ability to be able to be saved um, and with you one day in heaven, Lord. Thank you so much for all you do. And we just ask that you would uh, bless this time uh, as we remember your son's sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you pray with me again. Lord, we want to thank you for your son's uh, sacrifice, for the blood that he shed. Allow us to be able to really take it to heart, <clears throat> to know that your grace really is sufficient, that he came here as a human person, and that he was able to experience life uh, like we did, and, and even through that was blameless and sinless, Lord, and that his uh, sacrifice, his this perfect offering is what saves us and that the grace that we've been offered is a gift. Thank you so much for all you've done for us and for, for one day being with you in heaven. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen. Cordova, I know this is a, a hard time right now. And, and as we kind of look uh, towards the future, um, I know there's all kinds of different things that uh, we just don't know about. Um, uh, with my situation, uh, we're trying to figure out high school graduations and, and all kinds of other stuff. And, and people are looking for answers. Um, and I know this, that the, the real answer is that we have Christ in our lives and that as we move forward, that is a promise that we can hold on to. All right. I love you all. Um, man, this is weird. So uh, I will bid you adieu um, and uh, God be with you. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, I hope that you have been encouraged by our time together. Uh, I, I want to make just one real quick announcement. We're still working on some stuff when it comes to airing music so that there's no music uh, in today's service. But as soon as we get all that figured out, um, we will. Uh, I do want to point you to a playlist that is in the video description that you can click on and that'll lead you to a couple of songs that we hope will encourage you to listen to throughout your week or today um, together as a family. I hope that you will be a blessing to someone this week. And with that, um, allow me to end with this blessing to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you this day and all the days going forward. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ be with us.